Hi, I'm Frank Gorsh, and this is Comic Book Collector. You know, comic book collecting today is perhaps the most exciting hobby around. That's right. At one time, comic books were thought of as kid stuff, but today the comic book has grown up. Certainly Hollywood has always seen the comic book superhero as a big box office attraction, from the 1930 movie serials to the blockbuster mega hits of Batman, Superman, Dick Tracy. People flock to see their heroes on the big screen. And each week, TV viewers tune into Superman, Wonder Woman, and of course, Batman, where yours truly got a chance to portray his arch villain, the Riddler. <laughs> it's obvious, the comic book format has entertained readers and audiences for more than 60 years. Along with baseball and jazz, the comic book is truly Americana. So where did it all begin? The year was 1897. McKinley was in the White House. The diesel engine was invented, and William Randolph Hearst's New York American newspaper published Richard Outcult's The Yellow Kid for the first time. This hardcover collection of reprints of Outcult's 1896 comic strips, which appeared in the New York World newspaper, is recognized as the earliest comic book. From 1899 to 1917, over 70 hardcover books containing reprints of popular Sunday newspaper comic strips were published. Popular strips such as Buster Brown, Foxy Grandpa, Cats and Jammer Kids, Little Nemo, Mutt and Jeff, Barney Google, Joe Palooka, and Little Orphan Annie made up these collections. In 1917, the Saulfield Publishing Company was the first to use the term comic book. The book featured reprints of Clancy the Cop strips, and it actually entitled itself Comic Book. In 1922, MB Publishing issued the first monthly comic, which featured one strip per issue. It was called Comic Monthly. Seven years later, George Delacorte of Dell Publishing produced the first comic books that featured original strips. The first of these, entitled The Funnies, failed to gain acceptance. One of the main reasons may have been that the comic books sold in traditional newspaper size and the public felt as though they were buying an incomplete newspaper. Also available at the time was The Big Little Book, published by Whitman Publishing Company. The first issue contained The Adventures of Dick Tracy. The books were three to four hundred pages in length. In 1933, an idea struck Eastern Color Printing Company of Waterbury, Connecticut. This idea was to revolutionize the comic book. The printers at Eastern Color had done some experimenting and found that they could reduce the size of a comic book to 8 by 11 inches by taking a newspaper funny section and laying it horizontally so the strips were side by side. With this new method of printing comic books, Eastern executive Harry Wildenberg obtained newspaper reprints of strips such as Mutton Jeff, Hairbreath Harry, and Joe Palooka as contents for his new comics. His idea was to convince manufacturers to give them away as premiums. This method of advertising had been very successful throughout the previous decades with the tobacco company's use of baseball cards as premiums. Comic book salesman extraordinaire Max C. Gaines sold 10,000 comic books to Procter & Gamble, who in turn issued them as coupon giveaways. This first modern comic was called Funnies on Parade. With the realization that comic books were a hit, Eastern Color and Dell Publishing issued the first comic book that retailed to the public on newsstands. The first of these was Famous Funnies Series 1. It sold for 10 cents and remained a popular comic book for years to come. The 10 cent cover price remained the standard for the next 25 years. Well, look, Pilgrim's up in the sky. It's a bird. Oh, wait a second. If my memory serves me correctly, I believe that's a plane. Wait a second. You're both wrong. I want to tell you. That's my pal, Superman, eh? Maybe now I'll get some respect. How do you like that? A bird or a plane? That's Superman. What do you say, pal? 
Superman debuted in Action Comics number one. It was written by Jerry Siegel and drawn by Joe Shuster. The Man of Steel's appearance on the cover truly ignited what's referred to as the golden age of comics. No other comic book has been more important than this one, and certainly no other superhero has been more imitated or inspiring than Superman. A year later, DC's Detective Comics number 27 debuted The Batman. It was written by Bill Finger and illustrated by Bob Kane. Well, one of these 1939 comic books in mint condition just recently sold for $135,000. Kane, a young illustrator working for DC, was inspired by the success of the Superman character. At the time, Kane was earning $35 a week, while at the same time, Siegel and Schuster were earning $800 apiece for their work on Superman. As legend has it, Kane worked up the Batman character over a weekend. Influenced by Da Vinci's flying machine and the film The Bat Whispers, Kane created the original Batman. Although Superman and Batman shared a huge financial success, their personalities as superheroes were as different as day and night. Superman and Batman weren't the only attractions in their comic books. The villains, sidekicks, and spin-offs were as popular with readers as the superheroes themselves. That's right. Wait till you get a load of this. <laughs> In 1964, a gentleman had nothing to do on a long airplane flight, so he picked up a copy of Batman and was hooked. His name, William Dozier, the eventual producer and narrator of the 1966 Batman TV series. By 1940, the original comic books surpassed the Sunday reprints in newsstand sales. Publishers like Fawcett, Centaur, Fox Features, and Harry A. Chesler syndicates, among others, began introducing titles featuring science fiction, fantasy, war, and animals. It was evident that the comic book market was booming and readers were embracing these new characters as well as the new and exciting superheroes. Max C. Gaines left DC Comics in 1945 and opened... 